Yeah. Yes, he has uploaded it. Yes. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, please, let's be seated. The program is about to start. And as usual, as they come in the procession, we shall all rise on our feet to welcome our scholar, inaugural lecturer, a standing ovation. So please, let's uh, be seated comfortably. And if you don't have a nose mask, please get one. It is a condition for this hall. Thank you. Please, but we are rise on our feet to welcome the academic procession and, and the scholar. Please, Please let, let us rise.
You're most welcome. The next is the University of Portugal Anthem. After that, we are proceeding to the rest of the programs for today. It's on the screen. Thank you very much. Please be seated. May I respectfully at this point in time invite the Registrar of the University, Dr. Gloria Chinda, for the rest of the program. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I have the honor and privilege to invite the Vice Chancellor, represented by PVC and Professor Clifford, open to come and do his opening remarks. The seventh vice chancellor of, of our university, university, Professor Joseph Ajayinka, the vice chancellor of academics, the vice chancellor of research and development, past deputy vice chancellors, principal officers of our university. Members of the Government Council, Provost College of Health Sciences, Dean Graduate School, Dean Faculty of Management Sciences, Deans of other faculties, Heads of Departments, Distinguished Professors, Directors of centers and institutes, visiting <laughs> academics and colleagues, esteemed <laughs> administrative staff, <laughs> captains of industry, <laughs> my love, spiritual and temporal, cherished <laughs> friends and guests of the university, 
unique students of the University of Port Harcourt, members of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of our governing council, senate, management, staff and students of our university, I would like to welcome you to the first inaugural lecture in the year 2022 and the 179 in the University of Port series. I bring you a goodwill message from our ninth vice chancellor, Professor Owunare Abraham George Will, who is unavoidably absent. In fact, as we speak, he is representing the university in another official assignment in Lagos State and has asked me to stand in for him. Distinguished gentlemen, the topic of today's inaugural lecture is apt and timely, given the prevalence of fraud in our society. No time is better than now to talk about fraud. Especially now that the fraudulent prices are on the rise in this part of the world. But again, I am not in any way surprised that our inaugural lecturer, Professor Emmanuel Barichuka, chose to speak on fraud. Having spent his research time and days in this university looking into forensic accounting and investigative audit auditing, on this note, no to me, ladies and gentlemen, may I please urge you, you to sit back, back, back relax, relax, and listen, and listen to, to one of the most, most refined gentlemen in the Faculty of Elementary Sciences, Professor Emmanuel. Emanichuka, deliver the 179 inaugural lecture series of our university titled, Frosters and Fleet of Foods, the Forensic Accountant to the Rescue. Thank you. May I please request the inaugural lecturers to stand on his feet as I invite the Associate Dean Management Sciences representing the Dean to read his citation. Standing on the established protocol, this is the citation of Professor Emmanuel Amabs, Lovely Banachuka, Professor of Accounting, Department of Accounting, Faculty of Management Sciences. Professor Emmanuel Amas Love de Ibanachuka was born in March 26, 1952, to Palove de Joe Ibanachuka and late Mrs. Eunice Tobotome Ibanachuka Ne Uko, all of Okrika in Okrika local government area of River State. Professor Ibanachuka is happily married to Mrs. Rose Bubuma Ibanachuka Ne Danjombo and they are blessed with three children, Abie Richard Ibanachuka, Yuna Rose Ibanachuka, and Tonya Emmanuel Ibanachuka. Professor Ibanachuka has primary education at Okulika Boys School and St. Mary's Primary School, Okwaga Kumaya, and obtained the first school living certificate in 1964. Professor Ibanachuka attended the government secondary commercial school, Buguma, between 1969 and 1973, where he obtained the West African School Certificate in Division One. He worked briefly with the First Bank Nigeria Limited before traveling to the United Kingdom in 1975 for his prof professional certification as a chartered accountant. He attended Bonhamus College of Technology, UK, now Bonhamet University, and Slough College of Higher Education, Slough, UK, Thames University, between 1975 and 1979 
where he studied and wrote the examinations of the Association of Chartered Accountant, Certified Accountant, ACA to U, of UK. Professor Balichuka qualified as a Chartered Accountant in 1979. Professor Balichuka worked for Molly and Scott Chartered Accountants at Eton, Windsor, UK, as audit senior between 1979 and 1980. Professor Balichuka joined the Share UK Limited in October 1980 and subsequently transferred the services to the Share Petroleum Development Company of Nigeria, SPDC, where he rose to become the Chief Divisional Auditor, Western Division, in February 1988. He joined Pan African Bank Limited as the Assistant General Manager, Internal Control and Inspection, in December 1988, where he worked in various capacities until when he resigned and joined Persis Finance Limited as a general manager in May 1993. Professor Banachuka was employed by Papa Finance and Investment Company Limited as the general manager to chief executive officer where he worked until February 1998. In March 2nd, 1998, Professor Banachuka was employed by the University of Patakot as lecturer one in the Department of Accounting, Faculty of Management Sciences. He registered for the PhD program of the department as a pioneer student in October 1998, having earlier in 1992 obtained an MBA degree from River State University of Science and Technology, now River State University. The PhD program suffered a setback for several years because of the protracted illness and eventual death of his lecturer and supervisor, Professor DPS Achievement. Professor Banjuka successfully defended the PhD program in accounting in 2011. However, during the period of suspected, suspended uh, academic activities of the PhD program at the University of Patagon, Professor Barichuka registered for the MSc program at the Abia State University, Utudu, which he completed and was awarded an MSc degree in accountancy in 2010. Professor Barichuka steadily rose in rank and was promoted to the rank of professor effective October 1st, 2017. Professor Banachuka is a member of several professional bodies. He's a fellow of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants of UK, FCCA, a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria, FCA, a fellow of the Nigerian Accounting Association, FNLA, a fellow of the Academy of Management, and associate member of the Chartered Institute of Taxation of Nigeria, and a certified forensic accountant of Nigeria. Professor Banachuka has served in various capacities within and as the University of Patagon. A select few are as follows. He served as the external examiner to the River State University, Michael Opera University of Agriculture, and the Ignatius Ajuru University of Education. He was four time the coordinator to HOD of the Department of Accounting, spanning over eight years. He was a member of the audit committee of the World Bank ACA C4 projects. IPS. He served as a member of the Academy Board of Emirates. Energy Institute, a former chairman of the University Wide Fee Payment Verification Committee. He was a member of the Quality Assurance Quality Control Committee Chairman, ad hoc committee on the review of financial management of UDPS. The current chairman department graduate committee, he was the chief editor of the Journal of Accountancy of the Department of Accounting and former associate editor of the Faculty Journal of Management Sciences. He also served as the associate dean of the Faculty of Management Sciences. He was a member of the audit committee of the University of Patakot and the current chairman of the University IGRS Committee. He was the chairman of the audit committee of the Geoflux PLC. Professor Banishka is currently a priest in Ekanka Church and the chief internal auditor of the Ekanka Nigeria. He's a high chief, a head of the Banishka Royal House of the Ado Royal Dynasty of Okeka Kingdom. Professor Banjuka has attended and presented papers in many conferences at both local and international fora. He has published over 75 articles in referred national and international journals, as well as published five books, a chapter in a book and a monograph in, the, in his discipline. He has supervised several undergraduate and postgraduate students. Mr. Vice Chancellor Sir, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is my singular honor and privilege to present to you 
an elder scholar, a quiet, humble, and complete gentleman, a chartered accountant, a friend of all, a priest, and a high chief, to present the 179th inaugural lecture titled Four Stars, a Fleet of Food, the Forensic Accountant to Rescue. Thank you very much. Is Vice Chancellor Star? Past Vice Chancellors, Deputy Vice Chancellor Administration, Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Development, past Deputy Vice Chancellors, members of the Governing Council, Principal Officers of the University. Provost College of Health Sciences, Dean School of Graduate Studies, Dean of Faculties, Heads of Departments, Distinguished Professors, Directors of Institutes and Centers, Visiting Academics and Colleagues, Esteemed Administrative Staff, Captains of Industries, Cherished Friends and Guests, Unique students of Uniport, members of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. This lecture I'm going to present today is dedicated to the Sugmod, the Supreme God, the source of all life and all knowledge and all truth. Therefore, I'm most grateful to the Supreme Deity Sugmod, God, the Ek, Holy Spirit, the Mahanta, the Living Ek Master, the Godman, for the gift of life, the unconditional love, and the countless blessings in my life, especially during my academic uh, journey. I have come to understand, based on my faith, that life is a dream, but it remains a mystery until we realize that we create our own world. I acknowledge my late parents, but I love the Joe Ibanichuka, and Mrs. Eunice Tubatame Ibanichuka, who laid the foundation for my academic pursuits. The acknowledgement of my parents would be incomplete if I failed to mention my late stepmother, Madam Lucy Bifaka Ibanichuka, who ensured that all my financial needs at both the primary and the secondary levels we are well taken care of. My late maternal grandparents, Chief Uko Abiyak region, and Mrs. Henawa Helam Rosanna Uko, are also acknowledged for instilling in me the discipline and core values I exhibit today while living with them during my formative years as a youth. My uncle, Elder Macaulay Abel, Ribani Chuka, is equally appreciated for the sacrifice he made with his meager salary to contribute towards my passage to the United Kingdom to commence my professional certification. To my brothers and sisters, Mr. Joey Banichuka, Engineer Pekere Banichuka, Mrs. Catherine Okweze, Ms. Beatrice Banichuka, and Ms. Silva Banichuka, I thank you all for your love and encouragement. I sincerely acknowledge the University of Portacot, the university authorities, staff, and students for providing me the opportunity to serve life. Through teaching, through teaching, research, and administration. Specifically, I'm deeply grateful to the ninth branch Professor Wuna Rejo, for the intervention in the process of getting a date for this inaugural. When it when became perfectly clear, I was not going to get a date, and his subsequent approval of the lecture. I acknowledge with deep sense of gratitude 
the positive impact of the role of the seventh vice chancellor, Professor Joseph Adwokiki Ajenga, and the emeritus professor, Ben Ewiliabi, the then dean of graduate school and former deputy vice chancellor of research and development in my academic journey in this university, especially when some powerful forces did not want me to actualize my academic dreams. I'm most grateful to the nine, eight vice chancellor, Professor Ndo Walali, for initiating the process that led to my appointment as a professor. My special thanks go to Professor Clifford Offrum, the current Deputy Vice Chancellor Administration, whom I fondly call my brother, for his love, advice, and ever ready support in every aspect of my life. I'm also grateful to the current Dean of Graduate School and former Dean of Faculty of Management Sciences, Professor Barishwa Winne, for his contribution to what I have become. I appreciate the current Dean of Faculty of Management Sciences, Professor G. Ayumo, and the Associate Dean of Faculty of Management Sciences, Professor Lee Ramaika, my head of department, Dr. Chuku Mai Berere, for the love, love and service, and service to the faculty. faculty. A special, a special time, time, time to the, to a wonderful, wonderful woman, woman, the category of department, Madam Monica Igwe, for her selfless service to the department. I sincerely thank both the senior and junior academics and the faculty, faculty of management, management sciences, sciences for crossing, crossing my, my path and, and positively impacting my academic journey, journey especially, especially the following, following no specific, specific order. order. Professor E.J. Okereke, Professor Professor C.C. Professor, 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 Professor P.C. Wakama, Professor A.C. Ezirim, Professor C. Onoa, and many, many others too numerous to mention. Many thanks to the planning committee headed by Dr. Johnson Nkem Mwewu for a wonderful outing. I acknowledge other members of the committee, Mr. Henry Wobo, Mr. D. Yako, Dr. Temple Moses, Mr. Miyabaka Bigalabo, Dr. Dr. Mrs. Mrs. Chongo Juku, and, and Mr. Mr. Young Sonny Joe. I also acknowledge, acknowledge the contributions of the Institute of Chartered Accountants and Nigeria Aka, both at the national, national and local levels, levels to the success of this lecture. I think I want, I want to stop here a little bit to acknowledge the presence of the representative of the president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria in this lecture. Now I wish to thank the Institute, my great Institute, the Chartered Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria for the services they have rendered to humanity, for providing training to accountants in Nigeria over the years, since the establishment of ICANN Act 1965, and specifically the forensic accounting and also upholding high quality standards for professional practice in Nigeria. I thank you very much for that opportunity for being a member of ICAR. I acknowledge the love and support of my dear wife, Mrs. Rose Bubama Ibanichuka, for the encouragement and company which she readily provided when I needed them most. To my children, Abie, Yowuna, and Tonye, I appreciate and love you for tolerating my idiosyncrasies. My cousins, Associate Professor Adam Angozu Ohia, Dr. Ahamuko, Mrs. Chidema Okoye, Mrs. Rosabel Agwacha, you are remembered and cherished for your love, support, and magnanimity. Finally, to my friends and others out there, when I have failed to acknowledge, whom I have failed to acknowledge specifically, my apologies, because it was not deliberate, it was because of time and space constraints, I love and appreciate you all. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, ably represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor Administration. I'm sincerely grateful to you for granting me the opportunity to share my thoughts with the university community on this subject. Frosters are a fleet of fruit. The forensic accountant to rescue. I know English majors will wonder why it is to rescue rather than to, to the rescue. You will ex I will explain later at the end of this lecture. The area of this course has been a concern to me and the public particularly, as this informed my decision to choose the topic for this lecture. It is my considered opinion that the perpetrators of fraud in Nigeria 
who are in most cases not held accountable because of failed systems and ineffective fraud curbing procedures are victims of temptation, having been caught up in the web of Oscar Wilde's conjecture, who opined, I can resist everything except temptation. My question to you is that what can you resist? It is my opinion, Vice Chancellor, sir, that if the fraudsters in charge of a fleet of vehicles knew that there is a causative relation between fuel consumption and kilometer of speed driven by a car, or if a froster who is a facility manager working for a hotel chain or any organization knew that the diesel consumption by a generating set is allied with load or kilowatt, kilowatt hours, the set was in use. Or if a froster in a, an institution, whether private or public, knew that the phone stolen and laundered can be tracked and linked to the perpetrator. That through voice analysis, a froster's emotional responses and changes in voice tone during interview can be detected and measured to determine what really took place. If the froster who manipulated billings or invoices in a set of payment schedule knew the new, new, uh, natural occurrences of leading digits in a massive number of random figures can be utilized to detect financial crimes, fraudsters will be extra cautious and the extent of fraud perpetration will be minimized. Thus, funds saved in that regard because of minimal control infractions will be feasible to enhance national development and grow the economy. It is in considering the foregoing observations that I chose to title this lecture as Frosters a fleet of food, the forensic accountant to rescue. To rescue what? You will get to know what the forensic accountant is going to rescue. Fraud is everywhere. It's perpetrated by so many people. Some of us sitting down here will probably think, we are not victims or we are not beneficiaries. But you will understand that sometime, you know, you must apply to find yourself in a way whereby you are a recipient of fraudulent or, you know, criminal proceedings or proceeds. But the rate at which these activities were and are being carried out has become worrisome because there is no day that passes without one reading about the commission of these financial fraud in the news, print, and electronic media. The most disturbing aspect is that these individuals or corporate entities, in most cases, always got away with their loot because of failed systems, weak institutions, and inadequate procedures in place to hold them accountable. These unwholesome activities, which are in general of high magnitude, impact negatively on the nation's economy thus resulting in the economy exhibiting deficient performance, less growth, and inadequate national development. The traditional auditors who are expected to ensure that the management of an organization have adequate controls in place to minimize these infractions lack the expertise necessary to properly address this phenomenon called fraud. Consequently, the forensic accountant who has the necessary investigative tools is identified to be the last hope to confront the perpetrators of these unethical practices, to save the victims from being defrauded, and also to provide necessary evidence that will bring those involved to book. You have seen where the rescue comes in. There exists, however, a hypothetical proposition in the accounting and economic literature that private or public sector institutions and governments Radio with elevated levels of fraud, exhibit poor key performance indicators and declining or inadequate national development. And further, that institutions and governments with minimal fraud cases show improved economic performance and thus have a strong influence on economic boost and national development. Nigeria appears to be in the first category because of the preponderance of evidence of monumental and persistent fraud activities. Take the financial institutions, for example, to represent the private sector, the number of fraud cases in the banks in the year 2020. It will interest you to know that the banking sector represents the economic livelihood of any nation, including Nigeria. And apart from that, to, to a large extent, 
the survival or the performance of any economy depends to a large extent on the strength of the financial system. And therefore I've used the banking sector representing the banking, uh, private sector. So the pro number of fraud cases in the banks in the year 2020 increased from 52,754 in 2019 to 146,153 in 20 indicating 177.10% increase. The amount involved attempted fraud in 2019 was 204.65 billion naira. While in 2020, the banks reported 120.79 billion naira attempted fraud. The total actual loss in 2019 was 5.46 billion naira, while the loss in 2020 was 5.33 billion naira, maybe as a result of the deployment of forensic accountants who are part and parcel of the uh, control uh, unit or inf inspector unit of the banks. That's, that's why you can see. That's, that's why, why the high rate, rate of you know, fraud, fraud attempts, but well, actually the actual loss was less than expected. Now, petitions, of course, being investigated by e EFCC, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, increased from 6,782 cases in 2010 to 73,943 cases in 2019, indicating an increase of 990.36% for the public sector. Windsor in 2016, citing Pricewaterhouse Coopers reports, claims that corruption, which is a, a dimension of fraud, was estimated to cost Nigeria 20% of the GDP in 2016. And in 14 years time, if it is not checked, will cost Nigeria 37% of the GDP by 2030. This translates to an estimated loss of $2,000 per individual. If you translate that with 400 naira to a dollar, that will amount to 800,000 naira per person, a loss as a result of fraud. But this also translates to a loss of $534 billion. If you translate that at the exchange rate of 400, 400 naira to the dollar, that will amount to 231.6%, uh, 6, uh, 6 trillion naira loss. You can imagine what fraud is doing to the economy. And that is why in the public sector, the government is unable to deliver its mandate so much money is being lost through leakages. And of course, because of failed systems, inadequate procedures, and so on. That has also made government to go out on a sana borrowing. And that's the issue. That is why today we're not getting what we really needed. Poor infrastructure provisions, poor educational facilities, and so on and so forth. But this has raised several questions. Why has the country found itself and is still witnessing high profile cases of fraud. Why are these unscrupulous individuals not always held accountable? What can be done to save the establishment and the country? How can we bring the fraudsters to be accountable? Are there bright or bleak prospects giving out our pension, pension for corruption? These and many more questions will be addressed in this lecture. The rest of the lecture will take this format Fraud takes many forms. As a result, there are definitional issues which make different jurisdictions to define fraud differently. However, two elements are common in most definitions. One, deceit. Two, gaining unfair advantage by the perpetrator. Fraud as used in this context includes several criminal offenses which cover the art of employing trickery to receive benefit occasional expense to persons, organizations, and government. Financial crime, crimes against property, including the illegal conversion of ownership of property belonging to one person to one's own private use and advantage. It also includes criminal violation of financial regulations and laws. Economic growth is an increase in the production of goods and services compared from one period to another. Whilst national development means enhanced capacity of a country to provide improved social welfare in form of quality education, transportation infrastructure, medical care, portable water, and so on and so forth. And who is the forensic accountant we are talking about? It's a professional who puts into use forensic law and science to accounting concepts and techniques to produce results acceptable to the cause. He or she who is involved 
uses special uh, what you call uh, accounting principles, accounting practices, accounting techniques, and also deployment of what we call auditing and investigative skills to find out the facts in the financial setting. Forensic accountants, actually, they have reports which are very useful in court proceedings, providing litigation and investigative support, and they serve as expert witnesses in the eventual trial. To rescue, like I asked the question, to rescue what? In the title of this lecture, you have to rescue. The English majors will say to the rescue, but it's deliberate to put us in suspense. To talk about the rescue, what are we rescuing? The rescue is used metaphorically in this lecture to represent saving act, the saving acts of the forensic accountant, which are available to the establishment and individuals being defrauded and his provision of the means to make fraudsters to be held accountable. Fleet of foot, well, it's also used here figuratively in this lecture to denote fleet escape by fraudsters who elude accountability. Well, quickly look at types of fraud and financial crimes. The Association of Certified Fraud Examiners categorize into three, financial statement fraud, asset misappropriation, and corruption. You can see that corruption is a dimension of fraud. These are many subsets of fraud categories. It includes embezzlement, corruption, outright stealing, conversion, um, tax fraud, embezzlement, money laundering, overbilling, or padding of contracts, and so on and so forth. Why do people commit fraud and financial crimes? There are so many theories that actually can inform us on how and why reasons why people commit fraud. I have just taken just three, three out of so many to illustrate the reasons for fraud. One is the fraud triangle. The fraud triangle was actually propounded, theory was propounded by Donald Crazy in 1949. There are three components of what he called postulates. His work centered on what we call embezzlers of funds, whom he called trust violators. Now he identified these three components, pressure, rationalization, and opportunity. Pressure can be in form of unshareable needs of this perpetrator who eventually may probably look at because of gambling habits or drug habit, or it could be just sheer greed or whatever you may want to call it. They just want to steal. That he will rationalize it. Rationalization is an attitude. He tries, the perpetrator of fraud tries to silence his conscience by saying, oh, well, it's part of the national cake. I'm taking my own share. Or he will say, well, Nobody is watching. I'm not stealing it. I'm only just borrowing it. Or you could even say, well, everybody's doing it. So why can't I join them? They will want to join the joints. These are many ways he will rationalize, you know, he will just to see, you know, uh, silence his conscience so that he can continue to do those criminal acts. And of course, opportunity must be there for fraud to succeed. There must be opportunity. Lack of internal controls lose management, and so on and so forth, that can actually make the fraudster to see the way out and to steal. Now, Wolf and Wolfers, uh, uh, Hammerson, uh, in 2004, they came up they came with what they called the, the, the fraud, fraud diamond. diamond. It has, it has four, four components. components. They improved on the Donald Chris's, uh, fraud triangle by including what we call capability. Yes, there is pressure, or you may call incentive, opportunity, or rationalization. Wolf uh, uh, Hammerson says that fraud will never succeed anywhere unless the individual has that potentiality, that capability, that ability to steal, that ability to go ahead. The threats, if they are not there, he cannot steal. Even if you open the door, unless he has the courage to move in. And that is exactly how, why people will continue to take, uh, commit fraud. Now, the third theory was the potato chips theory. This theory explains that fraud can be addictive. If the fraudster is not caught in the process, in the act, 
he becomes emboldened and continues the practice until he makes a mistake that eventually exposes him. Fraud is like a person who eats potato chips and never gets satisfied. Potato chips are tasty and delicious, and everybody will want to eat it anywhere, anytime. Well, I'll quickly look at some of the examples of fraud and financial crimes committed between 2009 and 2018. Take, for example, the Nigerian Social Insurance Trust Fund. As a result of irregular contract award, when I say irregularity in contract award, it could be cases where contracts were awarded where they are not supposed to be awarded, or even when they are awarded, they were not performed, and so on and so forth. Government, Government lost about 5. 5. over 5.53 5. 5. billion. billion. Uh, the Ministry of Housing and Housing Works and Housing between 2014 and 2019 through irregularity in payments. Payments, payments, payments in the sense that payments were made some contracts contract that never existed, but monies were paid out and things like that. There are so many of them. It involves a uh, Nigerian Social Insurance Trust one. Ministry of Works. Now, Ministry of Works, loss of 1.5 billion Naira as a result. Now, uh, the Nigerian Social Insurance Trust Fund, 1.4 billion almost. The Ministry of Works again, 1.2 billion, and so on and so forth. Now, there are some payments without supporting documents. Payments were just made, monies withdrawn and shared. No evidence. About 43 MDAs. The MDAs are ministries, departments, and agencies. Over 15 billion Naira was involved in that case. Now, after stealing, likely misappropriations, you see these five items here. There were cases where monies were withdrawn as a result of all in the pretext of some, you know, you know going, going for, for monitoring, monitoring or inspection, inspection, inspection and monies, and monies were, were withdrawn, withdrawn and shared, and, shared, and so, so on. This five, if you add them, is over 4 point something billion. billion. Advances were collected and not returned, running to several million naira. Circumvention of uh, procurement procedures, and, and so, so on and so, on so forth. forth. Let's, Let's quickly look, look at, at the banks, banks. the losses, losses in, in the, the bank. bank. In 2015, 2.256 billion naira was lost to fraud, electronic fraud. In 2016, 2.19 billion naira was lost. In 2018, uh, 2.1 billion naira, 2019, 5.46 billion, and 2020, 5.33 billion naira. Lost, lost as, as a result, result of the fraud. fraud. The banks in 2014 lost through what we call across the counter fraud and internet banking. 6, 6 billion, 215, uh, 6.215 billion naira. The National Assembly spent 9.4 billion naira between 2009 and 2014. No documentary evidence to show how it was spent, who was paid, and what was involved. It was money shared. Now, funds were received by NPAs, and, and they are supposed, supposed to be remitted, remitted to the Treasury. treasury. And they were claimed to have been returned or whatever, paid in. But on a check, the receipt uh, accounts, we found out that they were not actually received. Three trillion naira. To that extent, unremitted. We can go on and on and on. CBN, you know, renovation of Paraco branch without supporting documents, 2.8 billion naira. Now, CBN purchased a property for National Planning Commission without any transaction documents or transaction agreement. What about 848 million naira? That was the time funds, funds were, supposed were supposed to be meant, meant for uh, uh, Ministry of Water, water resources. resources. And they, they were diverted. diverted. That, 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 those, those funds, funds were diverted to rehabilitation and construction of dams, which, which never, never took place. place. About 38.432 billion naira. 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 Procurement, Procurement of sanitizers were set for schools, schools and special uh, public places. Nobody saw that. 2.894 billion naira was spent. Subsidies were said or claimed to have been, you know, paid for fertilizer and youth employment. That's 1.32 billion. It was not done. We can go on and on and on and on. So let me quickly, let me quickly 
Well, well, is there in, in the there booklet, in the booklet that is out there. Now, in between 2009 and 2014, about 40 individuals whose names were not in the nominal role were included in nominal role. Oh, sorry, payments, payments were made. They were 12 million, they were paid 12 million naira per month for 12 months for five years. 720 million naira were involved. And of course, NMPC and NPDC unremitted. $1.48 billion. If you convert it at the appropriate rate, you know what I'm talking about. It runs into trillions. Now, this is a summary of the financial impacts of the infractions committed across the audited MDAs. You can see uh, in 2018, the total of 105.662 Naira was involved as loss arising from different infractions. The most prominent of them was failure in remittance of revenue and so on. But in 2017, only a total of 79.278 billion was lost. This is the uh, pictorial view of uh, exactly, exactly the, the, the you can, can see. see. Sorry, sorry. 105 billion. In 2018, 2018, and then of course, 2017, 2017, 2017, 2017, 2017, 2017, 2017, 2017, 2017, 2017, 2017, 2017, 2017, 2017, 2017, to cyber fraud between 2017 and 2018. The total fraud volume increased from 10,743 in 2015 to 38,852 in 2018, though the fraud loss reduced by 0.078% over that of 2015. The actual fraud loss by the banks in 2015, 16, 17, 18 was about 2.3 billion, 2.2 billion, 1.6 billion, and 2.1 billion respectively. So you can see fraud losses by banks. We're looking at fraud losses by channels, the different methods through which uh, funds were lost in the banks. You can see in 2018 that uh, mobile fraud as a result of uh, mobile, uh, you know, know, use, use of mobile, mobile uh, apps, apps and, and so on, on. About, about 599 million was lost. ATM losses, about 497 million, POS about 309, and so on. Total of almost 2.1 billion naira was lost in 2018. You can see the pictorial view of it. It's, it's descending. Mobile uh, fraud, 599, followed by ATM 497, 391 by POS, across the counter 202, and so on and so forth. If you compare that to 2016 fraud losses, uh, the scenario has changed. Instead of mobile uh, fraud, the across the counter fraud actually took lead here. And of course, there was a loss of 511 million Naira, followed by uh, ATM fraud of 485 or 65, sorry, and so on. I think this is clearly seen in the picture form over there. Yes, across the counter, 511, followed by ATM fraud, 463.5, then followed by uh, internet banking fraud, and so on and so forth. This is a summary of fraud that, that occurred, occurred in the banks, banks between 2015 and 2018. Now, that's why the fact that fraud attempts has you know, increased, but the actual losses actually have uh, come down in a way because of deployment of people with skills, appropriate skills to reduce fraudulent activities and so on. In 2015, 4.37, over 4.37 uh, million uh, Naira was involved in attempted fraud, but the actual loss was 2.256 uh, 
In 2016, 4.368 uh, over 4.368 billion, 2.196 was lost. In 2017, uh, was 4.034, and of course, loss was 1.6. In 2018, 9.047499391 Naira was attempted fraud, the value, but actual loss was 2.081. And this gives us the total of uh, 21.824708178, you know, attempted fraud, but only 8.165 was uh, lost. Now you can easily see it here clearly on the uh, Victoria view in 2015 when you compare this at a glance, 2016 and 2018, which is the highest, as you can see there. Now, fraud volumes, that is the actual number of attempts has increased. If you look at that, it was increasing, you know, 10,743 in 2015 to 19,534 to 25,000 and up to 38,852. You can see it's on the rise, but yet, you know, so it increased from 10,000 to 38,000. As a result of leakages, government has been unable to meet its requirements. That is providing whatever is necessary the infrastructure, uh, quality education, and so on and so forth. And as a result of that, Transparency International actually looked at this, you know, corruption index. Nigeria in 2020 was found to be 149 out of 183. And you can see that only in 2016, there was a slight improvement because the, 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 the index ranges from 100, which means... means uh, Highly, highly clean, clean to, to zero, zero, highly uh, uh, what we call corrupt. So we are at the lower end of uh, corruption. You can see 25, 26 out of 100, 28 was a slight improvement. So we are really, that's, you can see we are highly corrupt because as a result of what is happening, government has been unable to provide what actually. So and how has this leakages affected us generally? The relative poverty rate between 2000 in 1998 and 2010, you can see by 2018, that should be 2018. Now, in 1980, uh, estimated population was 65 million, Nara, uh, million people, you know, population, but 17.1 persons in population were in poverty. If you look at 1985, 75 persons uh, population, estimated population on 75 million, and then 34.7 was actually in poverty. 1992, 91, as against 39.2. In 2004, 126.3 million was estimated, out of which 68.7 persons are in poverty. In 2010, 163 million persons, out of which 112.47 were in poverty. And 2018, out of the population of 206.7 persons, 82.9 persons are in poverty. You can see that's why we are regarded as uh, world headquarters of poor people. Sorry, I've got to try. Okay, yeah, I'll finish. All right. So that's uh, just the pictorial view of it. And of course, you can see that. Now, how has it affected gross domestic product? Yes, we are doing well quite all right, but if you look at it, between 2015 and 2020, we have been going down. We have not even achieved the mark of 2015. And this is clearly seen on the this thing, the pictorial view of it. You can see in 2015, 492.44 you know, in billions of dollars. Now, we have been just trying to actually meet that. And 2020 is 429.1. I can see here the country went into recession, which of course you can clearly see here. Let me show you. Sorry. Uh, 
how has it affected growth rates? In 2015, 2.6% was actually uh, the growth rate. But in 2016, it was minus 1.62. So the company went into recession. And of course, we we'll tried to come out of recession in 2017. By 2019 and 2020, we are going into recession again, maybe compounded by COVID. And that is exactly, so you can see, this is where you can see the actual picture view. Here in 2016, we went into recession. And then of course in 2020, we also into recession and we have not done better than this and that. How has leakages affected labor, unemployment rates as percentage of total labor force? Between 2015 and 2020. In 2015, the unemployment rate was 9%. In 2016, was 13.4%. In 2017, 17.5%. But in 2020, about 3.3%, which means that out of every 10 uh, employable adults, all three persons are out of job. And that's what it means. So you can see it, pictorial view. We have, it has been rising, rising and rising. And so instead of improving, uh, reducing, it has gone up to that level. Three persons out of every 10 persons who are employable are with that work. The ANCA's uh, annual uh, misery index. Yeah is an index that measures the degree of economic distress felt by uh, the ordinary citizens. You know, it is that in the midst of uh, unemployment and coupled with rising costs and so on and so forth, you know, it is calculated. The, the higher the index, the greater the misery. That was exactly meant. It's calculated by taking the unemployment rate adding it to uh, the inflation rate, adding the bank lending rate, less uh, what we call the change in real GDP per capita. We can see that. That is how it is shown. We have not done better than that. So the higher the rate of the index, the greater the misery we felt, everybody, the individual, the ordinary citizen of the country felt. The role of the forensic accountant and what techniques can he apply? Now, of course, like I said, he provides litigation and investigative support to law enforcement agents and prosecutors that will enable them you know, to hold process accountable. He employs what we call a methodology which involves different methods and so on. Uh, additionally, he also provides what we call uh, forensic analytics which are very easy to, uh, to use to detect fraud, which the ordinary auditor, the traditional auditor does not have. So let us quickly look at some of the examples of that. Benford law is also, is one of the methods the forensic accountant can always apply. It's a statistical tool, which explains the data under study, shows a pattern signifying suspicious uh, movement. Benford law implies that the leftmost digit in a data of anomalous nature actually will conform to a particular formula. And that means that, for example, if you have random numbers running to several millions of Naira, and of course, if they are listed, the leftmost figure, assuming that one, one should not be more than 30.1%. Anything more than 30.1% shows that somebody must have manipulated the records, and you'll find that. And of course, if it were two, the two leftmost figure, it should be more than 17.6%. If it's more than 17.6% in the whole region, it means that somebody has manipulated because you have to investigate for them. If it's a three, it should be more than 12.5%, and so on and so forth until nine, which of course it shouldn't be more than 4.56%. So anything more than that, if you are adding figures, nine point something million, you are making a mistake. If it is more than 4.95, you'll be caught. And that's a way of the forensic accountant that can always use that. Regression analysis is also another uh, technique which uh, the forensic accountant can always employ. But here he tried to determine the strength and direction of the relationship between two or more variables. It's equivalent to what we do in what, uh, what uh, uh, budgetary monitoring, where we're doing variance analysis and so on. All we are trying to do is to compare, you know, 
you know, find out the variation between expected outcome and actual output. The lazy size factor is also another method the Prince accountant can use where he computes the proportion of the largest number uh, to the second largest number. Anytime the second largest number is a way out of this, it told me that somebody, something is wrong and it's a further investigation on that. Now, computer assisted auditing tools. These are also techniques that the Prince accountant can use. There are two major ones, which is data extraction software and financial so uh, uh, analysis software. The data extraction software extracts huge data, you know, for analysis using uh, uh, spreadsheets and so on. All they are trying to do is to do some mapping and do what we call uh, find a pattern and relationship whether something has gone wrong. We have financial analysis using monthly, quarterly, or yearly figures to do the same mapping. Try to identify you know, variations and so on and so forth. Now, data mining techniques where huge uh, data is involved. Mine data mining techniques, about three categories, three of them, discovery techniques, predictive modeling, and of course, deviation and link analysis. They are here, discovery techniques try to discover, you know, whether without even knowledge of fraud in any particular system, if they apply the discovery technique, they will know that something has gone wrong and they were able to, that's to discover. And now they use the predictive model to predict using what has found out, to predict the outcome, what is likely or what might have probably taken place. And the deviation, now a norm is established and then they compare the norm with the normal and to see whether the deviation actually warrants you know, further study. And so these are methods they can employ. Now there are two also, ratio analysis can also be a technique that of course uh, the process can, can use the gross margin index is quite different from the normal financial ratio which we employ in, uh, in accounting. Now, the, the gross margin index measures the fraud health of the organization, whereas the financial ratios measure the financial health of the organization. Now here, uh, when the ratio is one, great, is greater than one, it indicates that something has gone wrong. And of course, the investigation will be carried out. And now the asset quality, index is also similar to that. A ratio one more than, uh, greater than one means that something has gone wrong. They use it in actually looking out for fraud and error in non-current assets. Now, future network analysis. This is also uh, an analytical tool which the forensic accountant can use. It enables him to actually look at criminal gangs, groups, you know, so that to map their relationship, who benefited from what, and what actually, that's exactly what happens. They can do that. And with that, they will be able to trace, you know, your connection, no matter how many miles away you are from each other, they'll be able to map it, as you can see what is drawn on the screen there. So you can see that the relationship can be, you know, matching. Now, link analysis is also another, you know, uh, technique which they use, can use charts, maps, and diagrams. It helps to link entity to entity, entity to uh, uh, perpetrator of fraud. Try, it could be anything, could be event to event, and so on and so forth. Emails can be tracked and linked. You know, doesn't matter how many emails are involved and how many people are involved. There are many cases uh, similar, uh, like Crime Workbench, Daisy Netmap, Cop Link, and Orion Link are other examples of link analysis. Email database. I think the most popular here is the Carnivorous system. You know, it scans emails, and it's, although it is called a uh, DSC 1000, I think it's a popular, you know, popular used by the uh, FBI it, to monitor emails and electronic communication, and it will track, you know, all the various emails to the uh, the author of that email, and that is exactly what happens. They can use that. Now, biometric is also another area that uh, forensic accountants can employ: facial recognition, fingerprints, ear. The iris in the eye, also the voice biometric, neural work as artificial uh, intelligence. These are areas, for example, if you went to the bank, they say, okay, stay very well, watch, put your eye very well and so on. That's they are trying to get the iris of the eye, you know, to, so that in case there's any, you know, uh, fraud attempt by somebody else who is not the same thing, is able to be detected. Fingerprints and uh, facial recognition is also another area. Now, I call it the uh, artificial intelligence here, yeah, you know, uh, is voice, you know, uh, sorry, it's called the electronic brain. It has the capability of detecting trustless behavior, you know, and they will analyze and alert staff 
MasterCard, Visa, and American uh, Express use uh, this particular method to scrutinize transactions before they are approved. Now let's quickly look at case studies that actually you know, goes to confirm. Now the case studies confirm that forensic accountant can help to reduce fraud in any particular system. Not even some, some cases can completely you know, uh, eliminate fraud, but of course, human nature. When there's collusion, that's always a problem. But however, let's quickly look at a few cases. ABN um, uh, Amro uh, Bank. Now they have about over 4 million customers that always call in about 35 million calls. They employ what we call uh, electronic banking. Now with employment of voice biometric, they were able to reduce fraud, you know, uh, and then of course, boost security. An insurance company group in, the, in Europe uh, has about 20 branches, 20 regional branches, successfully deployed. RA7 is a voice biometric, you know. Now, when this company employed this RA7, within one month, they were able to reduce their fraud uh, cases by 5%, and another 22% identify areas where fraud can easily occur. The government uh, rebate program in the US also use what we call uh, forensic uh, data analytics to identify unusual transactions such as shared names, address and contact details, and clustering of claims by date, location, and type of claim, and so on and so forth. The Office of the New York State Controller, Controller also used forensic analytics in 2005, where they were able to detect fraud amounting to $11.3 million among documents that were either destroyed or missing. So the forensic accountant can provide help. Now in Nigeria, for example, now most state governments have reduced ghost worker fraud in their payroll by deploying fingerprints and facial biometrics. These are all forensic analytical tools. Now source funds, when they are saved, are available to develop the nation and so on. EFCC has successfully deployed forensic analytics to trace laundered funds in some high profile cases, identify forgery and so on. Now, for example, former Taraba State Governor, Joel Yami was sentenced to 12 years in prison with a fine of 495 million. Former Plateau Governor, Joshua Darie, 10 years in prison. Ojuku Roland was in prison, two years in prison and he forfeited two point over $2.917 million, the federal government. Chubike, Ngene Chubike, the same thing, two years imprisonment, forfeited $2.495 million to the government. Abdullahi, two years and 10 years, especially for two counts. Ibibia Jack, 30 years without option of fine, a restitution of $28.550 million, uh, $28.55 million. Uh, Nara was forfeited restitution. Of course, in two cases, he was found guilty. And then the next one was about 29.7. Now, in years, 60 years and five years, respectively. Now, we're recommending that actually the in furtherance of the suggestions of Hubbard, who also looked at, you know, forensic, particularly with respect to forensic education, we are saying that I'm saying that the government, Nigerian government, should as a necessity and a concern of deliberate policy using the NUC platform, develop a benchmark minimum academic standard, BIMAS, for forensic accounting education in tertiary institutions. This will effectively equip students with special skill set required for fraud and financial crimes auditing. And tertiary institutions should be encouraged to mount academic programs specializing in forensic accounting in line with the NUCB must to be developed. I have been involved in accreditation in a number of universities. I found out that it's optional. Not all the universities actually have that at the tertiary level, except in some universities you find it at the master's level. But we're encouraged, we're saying that it should start from the you know, undergraduate level. So by the time you go up to the master's or specialize in it, you will have been uh, very much versed in it. There should be a legal requirement for specialists in forensic accounting, known as forensic accounting, to regularly audit public sector institutions and key private sector organizations as aspect of corporate governance.
to stem the tide of system, systemic fraud and financial crime in Nigeria. The prosecution of all fraud and financial crime cases should be supported by forensic efforts. This is being done at the moment, but it's limited in scale. We're suggesting that it should be sustained and expanded because forensic accountants serve as forensic experts, as well as uh, what we call expert witnesses, and they provide litigation and investigative support. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, the objectives of this lecture are to show that the preponderance of monumental fraud and financial crimes being perpetrated by fraudsters, who are in most cases at large and elude accountability, will result in poor national development and diminish economic growth. That the adoption of, adoption of purposeful accounting policies regarding anti-fraud practices, such as forensic accounting in private or public sector organizations can cope or minimize fraud or financial crimes and provide the means to identify the fraudsters and hold them accountable. Consequently, the funds released in that regard could be used for national development and economic growth. This lecture has shown the extent of fraud and financial crimes in Nigeria, whose monetary worth is mind boggling, which incidentally has adversely affected national development and economic growth as shown in the poor economic indices highlighted in the presentation. Several examples of forensic analytics were given and explained that if adopted as deliberate accounting policies in the private or public sector organizations can effectively curb or minimize the current increased level of fraud and financial crimes in Nigeria. Thus, fraudsters who are hitherto at large and had eluded scrutiny can be apprehended and held accountable and the funds saved as a result if properly utilized, will grow the economy, thereby enhancing national development. Yeah.
Thank you for listening. Thank you. Please let's put our hands together for this Eroden Scholar. Please, can you officially hand over the copy of this lecture to the Vice Chancellor of the University? Please, as he's going, let's encourage him. Let's put our hands together for him. Eroden Scholar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kola. Thank you, sir. Let me respectfully hand over to the registrar for the next action. Thank you. Let me also say thank you to our 179 inaugural lecturer for teaching us this evening. May I, at this point in time, invite the Vice Chancellor, heavily represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor Admin, to do his closing remarks. Thank you. Once more, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I stand on our well-established protocol. Sincerely, I did not expect anything less because uh, Professor Barichuka has demonstrated that he has all it takes to speak on issues body forensic accounting and investigative auditing. I am so delighted that this five-star performance is coming from somebody, not just from our faculty, but from my own department. In this preamble, our inaugural lecturer opined that prevailing case of fraud is because fraudsters will not believe that they will be caught. However, one way or the other, by and large, a day will come when their excesses will be exposed. He, he argued that failing systems, weak institutions, and inadequate internal controls are the major reasons why fraudsters get away with their loot. Of course, this act has impacted our economy negatively. Using the fraud triangle, he demonstrated that fraud results when pressure and rationalization meet opportunity. He then enumerated fraud cases in Nigeria, the magnitude of economic losses resulting from those cases, and the devastating consequences to our national economy. He established a nexus between the prevalence of fraud and unemployment in Nigeria. In profiling solution, the Nora lecturer discussed how technology could be used to fight fraud. He was so particular about use of biometric and artificial intelligence in fraud prevention. He recommended, among all things, among other things, that higher institutions be encouraged to set up and run specialized programs in forensic accounting and investigative auditing. Of course, the Dean of Honorary Science is here, so you take note. The ranking by the Transparency Index is not too good for Nigeria. Hence, I believe that this is a time for us to take our uh, action. This evening, ladies and gentlemen, I've often sat here to watch some of our finest professors deliver their inaugural lectures and also profile solutions to national issues. The big question is why are those issues still lingering? 
On this note, I would like to thank our inaugural lecturer, Professor Emmanuel Lebanijuka, and also reassure him that the university will look at the recommendations you have made, a certain of them that are within the control of management. I also like to thank as many as have contributed in diverse ways to make this inaugural lecture a success. You can agree with me that this lecture is well, well attended. So I want to thank you for attending and once more, may the almighty God bless you really good. Well, I do thank you so much for finding time to be here today. It was a wonderful one. Thank you very much. Listen to the few announcements. The next inaugural lecture, 180 series, is titled The Elusive Growth and, and Development, Development in Nigeria. Nigeria. What, what did, did we, we do wrong? wrong? The Elusive Growth and Development in Nigeria. What did we do wrong? The lecturer is Professor Ijoma Kalolo. Department, Department of Economics, of Economics Faculty, Faculty of Social, Social Sciences. And the date is 27th January 2022. The time is 3 p.m. The venue is here in between Banigo Auditorium. Please, you are cordially invited. It's free. Thank you. I also want to inform you that. that a very, a very special, special and brief, brief reception, reception has been has organized, organized for Professor Ibanichuka by the university. It's called Cocktail. And, and this cocktail is for himself, his immediate family, and a few select friends that you have invited, and the professors and senate members that are here. Now, if you are not mentioned in this category, I have been told to inform you that something very special has been prepared for you. As you are leaving, use the four exit doors. And when you get there, you see a very sumptuous meal prepared for you. Just pick one and you go. Now, this one is for those with invitation card. Invitation cards were sent out. If you have one, then you also have another place. And the venue is Amatu Bread. Amatu Bread is the next hall by my right, which is your left, is this way. As you come out, you go there. Without cards, you will not be admitted. Please, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. We have come to the end of this wonderful program, so please may I respectfully. May I respectfully, at this point in time, invite us to rise as we take the university anthem. Say where are you? For the rain, all nice and swampy days. Shining in the sky, 
officers here we leave and then former vice chancellors principal officers we also leave so please wherever you are remain there please thank you